has been kind of staying with me. Um, We're talking about hope and we're talking about the love that um, we have for the Lord and that the Lord has for us. So this is going to be in John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. This kind of reminds me that we don't go off of our own strength. The strength that we have to get through the day, to get through the week, that's all in the Lord. And all of the gross or the embarrassing or the guilty things that we have in us, if we lift that up to the Lord, he prunes that and he takes that away to make you more like him. So let's keep that in mind as we sing, Jesus, we love you.
Jesus, thank you so much for being with us every single step of the way. Thank you for holding us in your hands. Thank you for guiding our paths. Lord, I pray that we walk with you this week. We give our cares to you. We give all of our anxieties to you. Lord, help us grow a foundation in you so that we can look more and more like you each and every day. Lord, I pray for the struggles that um, these students might be going through that no one even knows about. Lord, I pray that they find a home in you. I hope that they find a place in you. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So as Arthur said, I'm not here to talk about the perils of dating relationships, although I do enjoy that sometime. Um, maybe next year we'll talk about that. Um, students in my interpersonal class usually get a good dose of that when we get to dating relationships. What I am here to talk to you about today is relationships and stress. And it's not how much relationships stress you out. Um, it's how stress and how you cope with stress and how you manage life can affect your relationships. So uh, this is a book, uh, Margin, that my seniors get to read. Um, and I read this years ago, and I felt that it was life-changing. Um, this is a book all about creating space, uh, specifically space for the things that matter. And the book title, I don't know if you can see that very well, um, it says, Restoring Margin um, and physical, emotional limits, sorry, this thing's getting in my way here, um, and basically creating, creating space in different areas. So I'm gonna talk a bit about some stuff from that book um, and bring some psychology into it. And also, um, this author's written books called Balance and Contentment, which I think are three books that every college student should read, um, probably at different times during their tenure here. So when I think of student stress, and it's interesting because I did a, presentation very similar to this about three years ago. And I thought students were stressed out then, um, which is, is almost comical now thinking about it um, and looking at the stress that all of you have had to negotiate this year. Um, and so hopefully what I talk about today can help you both manage that, but also think about uh, stress beyond college and how you'll, how you'll manage and deal with that in relationships. So when we look at our lives and we look at what what creates stress for us? What creates difficulty? We've got some different areas. So most of our progress in society right now is in these two areas, physical environment. There's more wealth, significantly more technology. I mean, this year, look at what you've probably learned this year with technology. Um, when you look at your professors, like as much as you feel like you've had a learning curve, um, some of your professors have had a very steep learning curve this year, and I'm very impressed with how well um, so many of our faculty have adjusted to the technology demands. Um, health, the material world. Um, you know, you'll see, and uh, one of the things I'll talk about in sharing a story later is even when you go to the grocery store, there are so many choices. Like I used to love to go to the grocery store and now it's almost like cognitive overload every time I have to go if I don't have a very specific list. And the cognitive environment. You know, we have a world where technology is literally at your fingertips. You know, you can look up virtually anything, but as you've probably learned, um, there's almost too much knowledge out there. You can start to look something up on Google, and all of a sudden you end up looking at cat pictures or something else, and you've all of a sudden lost two hours. Um, there's lots of information out there, lots of knowledge. Um, you know, there's so many ways to get educated. I know. Uh, Anytime I'm trying to learn to do something, typically I go to YouTube, which is, is kind of funny, but if I'm trying to learn to do a new technology thing, I know that somebody has probably put up a YouTube video about it, and before I go asking a lot of people questions, I could probably look it up on YouTube first. Most of our pain in society right now is with social environment. You know, there's a lot of demands from family, friends, neighbors, the church, societal world. I don't know if you've ever had a day where you felt like people are just making constant demands on your time, 
or on your energy. Also the emotional environment, feelings, attitudes, the psychological world. Um, I do think that people are more stressed in this generation than, um, than previous generations. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit I have a smartphone and I both love and hate it. I love that when I wanna look something up and I want something to be convenient, it's right there. I hate the fact that everything is right there. I remember the days like when I was sitting in your chair watching chapel, I knew that I wasn't going to have to respond to anything until I got back to my room and maybe I had a voicemail message there. Um, nobody had cell phones. I mean, they were so rare when I was in college. Like you, you had built in space where there was no expectation that people would get back to you right away. And, and we've increased those demands where it's not even, hey, get back to me today. It's, hey, I sent you a text an hour ago. What's going on? Like, why haven't you gotten back with me? And we have these instantaneous demands on our, our time, on our energy, and that can cause a lot of stress. And then even the spiritual environment. Um, you know, when we look at the stresses that we see, I mean, I look at, and it's interesting, I was trying to think the last time where I worshiped with a group of people because we've been doing virtual church and, and it was such an amazing feeling and thank you guys for the worship today. I, I always feel like it's great worship when it points to something higher um, and, and it just felt very restorative to my soul today, so thank you. Um, but we, we can have a lot of stress. I mean, when I talk to students and I see the relationship with God being one of the things that, that stresses them out, they, you know, they feel like it's not where it needs to be or it's the relationship with God isn't in the right place. And there can be a lot of stress that goes with that. Um, so if you've taken intro to psychology um, and you've talked about stress, you've probably seen something like this. This is what's called the human function curve. And basically what this does is it tries to put stress on this curve so you can understand, okay, where should you be with stress? So on one side, you've got productivity. On the other side, you've got stress. And what you see is, um, and I'll talk about this with the York Stotson law in a minute, but basically we need some amount of stress to be productive in life. And I've seen this where oftentimes over the summer, students are very unproductive. They read like nothing. They watch a lot of Netflix a lot of times, but it's not always the most productive time of year, um, which you would think it would be. You would think that when you have tons of time and space and nobody's putting demands on you, that you'd be reading 10, 12 books over the summer, you know, you'd, be, you'd be learning a new skill, but quite often there's not enough stress during that time. Um, and so what we know is you need a, a moderate level of stress to be productive. But what you find is if you have too much stress, it begins to push you into fatigue or exhaustion. And if you have even more stress, it pushes you into fatigue. And what you see is there's that critical point of burnout there. And a lot of what I've seen, and, and I think this year has concerned me more than any other year because the breaks haven't really been breaks is the sense I get. And I totally understand that where I think in the past when you'd, when you'd go home for Christmas break, you'd come back feeling restored to where you, you got away for a while, you got to do some fun things. And the sense I'm getting more and more is even when you have breaks, and I get this, where we haven't, we haven't gone out to eat in months. Um, and my son was even telling me, I have a six-year-old son, Toby, and he was even telling me, Daddy, when can we go outside again? I'm like, well, buddy, it's gonna be really cold for the next couple of weeks. It's like, is summer gonna get here soon? It's like, no, buddy, it's not. <laughs> um, but I think we've all had a year where we've, we've lacked some of those breaks, that margin. And, and so I'm more acutely aware of that this year where I've noticed that more in my own life and I've noticed it more in your lives as I've talked with students. And, and I think it's something that students desperately need. And, and part of what I'm gonna challenge you on today and Thursday, because you may feel like, well, I can't take a vacation. I can't, I can't get away in a meaningful way. Um, and what I'm gonna challenge you with is you can still build margin into your life. Um, Arthur and I were talking right before chapel and he's, he read this book, I think, in graduate school. And one of the things he'd mentioned and, and we talked about is I learned a few years ago not to set hour-long appointments. 
like when, if you used to look at my schedule, it'd be okay, one to two appointment, two to three, three to four. And I read a book one time where it talked about, um, it might've been in Margin or another book, basically, why do, you, why do you do that to yourself? Why do you schedule appointments back to back to back? Because we all do that. We look at our schedule and it's like, okay, I can give you an hour. And so now when I schedule appointments, it's typically 45 minutes. And that way I build in some time where I can answer an email. I can respond to a phone call. I can call home and see how my family's doing. And I've got these little points during the day because when we create time, we tend to want to fill it with stuff. Okay, healthy stress. So um, interesting studies done, and, and this has led to what we call the Yerkes-Dotson Law. We need an optimal level of stimulation to do well, too little or too much, and our productivity diminishes. This is part of why many of you know that in order to learn, you need to be in a college environment or you need to be in a learning environment. Because the reality is, in terms of acquisition of knowledge, you could read tons and tons of books, you could watch online speeches, you could educate yourself. Um, but we don't always do that. Because for many of us, we need the deadlines. We need other people telling us like, hey, you know, you've gotta get this done at a certain time. This is part of why for a lot of doctoral programs, there's so few people that actually finish their dissertations. They get all the way through classes, like two years, three years of classes. They hit dissertation when somebody says, okay, go, and they never get it done. And I think a lot of it's because the, the stress isn't there, the pressure isn't there. So when you look at dealing with stress in your life, and I'm gonna talk, like I said, about margin, contentment, and balance over the course of the next few days. Um, some things you can do in just trying to manage stress, because again, we, I think we all are well aware of stresses in our life right now, between COVID, between changing expectations, adapting to online schooling. Um, you know, I think the cool thing for most of you is now you have the answer to the question of, should I pursue an online graduate degree? Like, that used to be a question for students. I think students really know now whether or not that's some, an environment that they would thrive in. Um, but when we look at dealing with stress, here's some things that you can do or that we know you can do. One, set difficult but attainable goals. Um, first of all, and this sounds silly, but just set goals. I'm amazed how many conversations I have with students where there's no goals. There's no goals for their week. There's no goals for their year. They don't think about five years, 10 years. Their goal is simply, I have to get to the end of the semester, which again is, is a good goal. I think it's important. Um, but if that's the only goal you set, my guess is most of you will reach that goal. Um, but if you set yourself more challenging goals, what we know is those who set goals by far tend to be more productive and tend to be happier. Um, back when we were able to take vacations, every year, every summer, I would try to sit on a beach somewhere and I would do one year, five year, and 10 year goals. And there was just something really calming about that for me because I got to see my progress and I got to get a sense of how am I doing with prioritizing things in my life? Like are my priorities in the right place? When you set goals, especially challenging goals for yourself, it gives you a benchmark. It gives you something to reach towards. Identify task, task strategies. Um, one of the things I've learned is you've gotta find the right system for yourself to get things done. My guess is some of you are list makers. You love making lists, and if you're like me, you'll do something and then you'll add it to a list just so you can cross it off because it makes you feel good. Um, you found what works for you. I, I've learned that for a lot of students, they haven't found that yet. They haven't found the thing where it's like, this is the thing that clicks for me, that keeps it right in front of me so I can see what I'm working on and what I need to do. But in order to deal with stress, and I'm not just saying be more organized, because for some people it's not about organization, it's about what, what system works well for you. Some of you have really messy rooms, I'm sure, but you know exactly where everything is. Like it's a system that works for you. And the minute somebody comes, like if your mom came in and be like, hey, I cleaned your room for you, it would be chaos. It'd be a mess. But it's important to find the system that works for you and how do you know that? You get feedback. And a lot of your feedback occurs through goals. If you're accomplishing all your goals and you've got kind of a messy system, but it works, that's okay. Use imagery. Try to think about what do you want life to look like? You know, try to project, okay, 
here's what life without stress would look like, which I, I'll tell you, it's taken me years to figure out what that looks like at home. Um, it's been a, a roller coaster of a six years because we have two kids. We have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, Toby and Asa. And they're a blast, and they're also really exhausting. Um, we decided to wait 10 years to have kids after getting married, which in some ways was an awesome idea. I got through school. But the flip side of that is we're much older now. And so, like, crawling around on the floor, playing games, like, wrestling. My sons love to wrestle. can be really exhausting. And I have to always kind of keep in mind, like, okay, what, what are my priorities? What are my goals? What am I trying to envision? And so I finally found what I would kind of call my happy place at home. And it's, it's honestly, I don't know if I told him this, it's thanks to Arthur. Um, Arthur had given me a, a gift card at one point, and uh, I used it to buy a hammock and a hammock stand. Because students were like raving about hammocks. It's like, hey, these are the best. I'd see students out in hammocks. I'm like, there's something to this. And so I set up this hammock and hammock stand in my backyard. And again, this, this makes me feel really old to say, but my favorite thing in the world is laying in the hammock and watching birds. Like it's literally, it's the most calming thing in the world. Like I'll sit there, I've got like four bird feeders up now. I just love laying in the hammock and just watching the birds. It's like, this is the least stressful thing in my life right now. This is amazing. And so, you know, the boys will come out with me every once in a while and sit in the hammock. And that's like, I get 15 minutes of time where I just get to go out there every day when it's nice. Um, the other thing is carefully managing time. If you're anything like I was in college, you probably waste a lot of time. And it's on things where if you were looking at your priorities, um, it shouldn't necessarily be a high priority. Uh, you know, I think about uh, Netflix. And, and I, I have to admit, I was kind of surprised to hear Friends was a popular show again, and that students were really into Friends, which I'm actually curious to watch it again sometime. Um, probably when my kids are like 18, maybe when I have time, but um, I've never seen it like chronologically. Like, it, which sounds kind of weird. When you look at Netflix, like typically you start on season one and you watch it through, but that wasn't how it worked back when it was on television. Like you'd see a random episode. And so I've seen, I've probably seen most of Friends, but I've never actually seen it chronologically. But I'll hear students talk about like watching seasons of something over a weekend, which is awesome to be able to do, but it really begs the question, are you carefully managing your time? Do you structure your environment in any sort of meaningful way? Um, if you're looking at trying to manage stress, if you're looking at trying to deal with things that are coming your way, the more structured your environment, the better you're able to manage that. And I'll give you an example. Um, so in the mornings, I have a very structured routine because my son Toby has to get ready for first grade and my son Asa has to get ready for preschool. And my wife's getting ready and I'm getting ready for work. And so I have it down to the minute what needs to occur at what time. If something messes that up, it causes an enormous amount of stress because I know if I get the boys up by this time, if I get breakfast going by this time, if we get them you know, dressed by this time, we have enough margin for them to be able to make the bus. Otherwise, somebody's taking them to school. And I have had to structure that morning because of that where it's not just my plans, but it's multiple people's plans. Seek help when needed. And as a society, we are horrible with this. Honestly, we are horrible with this. We have created in this society this idea that you can do it on your own, that you don't need help, and that somehow you're, you're weaker or less than if you do ask for help. And that just makes me really sad. Like, it makes me sad for our culture where, especially right now, people desperately need help support, they need encouragement, they need wisdom and knowledge from people. And I think a lot of times what happens, and I see this because I have students journal in a lot of my classes, and so I have the chance to see a window into what's going on inside versus what's being shown outside, and there's a huge disconnect sometimes. I see students where they give the impression that I've got it all together, but inwardly they're just torn up or in pain, but they don't reach out. They don't ask for help because they feel like they don't want to be a burden on somebody or, well, other people are struggling probably more than I am. And I don't know how the counseling department feels about this, but um, I'm always encouraging students in interpersonal like, hey, go to counseling. 
It's free. Take advantage of it. If you had any idea how much counseling costs when you get out of college, like, I think you would take advantage of it. When I did private practice, I charged between $40 and $120 an hour. And so to get it for free for four years where there's something you need to work on, that's an amazing opportunity. And it's a great way to deal with stress, which I'll tell you, when I was here in college, um, my parents were going through a separation, which eventually led to a divorce, um, a lot of turmoil. And as a psychology major, I'm like, you know what? I should probably go to counseling. Like, if I'm going to tell other people to go to counseling, if I'm going to be a counselor, I should probably do this right now. Like, I cognitively, I know this is the right time to do this in my life. And so I went to Dave Kinningham, and I went to, I think it was five sessions of counseling, and it was, it was like the best thing ever. Because I got to just, it's almost like backing up a dump truck and just dumping everything and just being able to walk away from it. Or like every frustration, every bit of anger, things I couldn't project to my family or didn't feel comfortable sharing with my friends, I was able to share in a counseling environment where Dave just took, just sat there and just took it. And he was calm. He didn't get upset. I was really angry at times, and he's just really chill. I'm like, this is really nice. This is nice just to be able to talk about exactly how I'm feeling about this situation, about how frustrated or angry I am with the situation that I'm in because of choices my parents have made. And it was very freeing. Like I, just, I would walk out of that session, and I would just feel the stress just kind of roll off. And some of you have experienced that, where you've gone to counseling and you've been able to create that safe space where you get to have a place where you know, hey, once a week or once every two weeks, my stress is going to go away for a while. And sometimes that's all you need. You just need time where you can let go of it. Learn to self-monitor. Again, I think as a culture, we're not always very good at this. I think some people are better than others. I know that a lot of people are really bad at this because they go to Walmart like every few days. If you ever go to Walmart and you see people where they have their cart parked one way and they're standing the other way and you can't get through the aisles and there's people waiting on both directions, those are people who are very low self-monitor. They're not aware of how their actions are affecting other people. And again, I just psychologically, I'm always reminded of that for some reason at Walmart. Um, but when you learn to self-monitor, you learn to pay attention to how is my stuff affecting other people? How am I doing right now? And I'm amazed at how often people are disconnected from their own emotional experiences. They really don't know how they come across to other people. And, and this isn't like the select few. This is, this is most people. I've, I've watched couples argue and fight in counseling. And, you know, I'll stop them and be like, how did you just talk to each other? Well, this is, you know, this is how we normally talk. Like, you normally yell at each other? Oh, we weren't yelling. It's like, yeah, you were. But there's a lack of awareness sometimes for how do my actions come out and how do they affect other people. When you learn to self-monitor and you learn to pay attention to that, and I'll talk about some strategies probably on Thursday. Um, one, and we'll get to that, it, it becomes a lot easier to manage your stress. Learn to self-evaluate. This is part of why I encourage students to journal, to take the time to journal and then go back and read it. And it's amazing sometimes where you don't even realize how you feel about something until you write about it. Learn to create positive outcomes. Um, one of the exercises that I have students do, and this is a bit of forecasting for students in my psychology of health and wellness class, is I have students plan a good day. I have students actually plan a good day, something that they're really looking forward to. Because a lot of times what we do is we passively wait for things to happen to us. And I'll ask students, like, hey, what do you have to look forward to? Summer? Like, wow, it's going to be a long semester for you if that's the only thing you're looking forward to. But if you plan something like, hey, we're going to do a, you know, a friend's get to, you know, Netflix get together, we're going to make smoothies, and you know, hey, Thursday night, this is the time we're going to do something like this. It's amazing how much it changes your mood, your outlook, and helps you alleviate a lot of stress when you know, hey, if I can just get through the next two days, I've got something to look forward to. You know, sometimes people do this even with like Netflix shows where it's like, I can't watch the next episode until this point in the week. And you give yourself something to look forward to, which a good psychological tip is pair Netflix shows you want to watch with exercise you need to do. Don't watch the episode unless you're exercising. It completely changes how you feel about exercise. 
And the last thing we know is multiple roles. One of the most important parts of managing stress is not to have all your stress concentrated in one role in your life. Like if the only thing, right, the only role that you're playing right now is a role as a student, and that's not going well, the stress is overwhelming. If, however, you find that you're volunteering at your church or you're really connected to a different group, you know, you're part of joyful noise or there's something where it's, it's a role that helps to define you in a different way. When one part of your life is really stressful and not going great, you'll find that you naturally lean into the other parts of your life, which is a huge way to help manage stress. Okay, I'm going to talk about some other experiences. We'll talk about balance and contentment on Thursday. Um, before I do that, I just want to encourage you over the next couple days, um, try to plan a positive outcome. Like, try to plan something in your week that is really worth looking forward to. And that's a big part when we talk about creating balance in your life, when you talk about having contentment, that's part of it. Because again, if your only goal right now is I've got to get to the end, and for some of you that might be like graduation, um, you'll learn in life you've got to have more things to look forward to than just those big things. Otherwise, life feels pretty overwhelming. Okay, thank you, and I will see you guys on Thursday.